Hello, true duelists. YGO Strats here, putting on my best. <laughs> Hello, true duelists. YGO Strats here. I was gonna do a Belgian accent for this, for this, but it's it's the worst thing I've ever heard. So I'm not I'm not gonna include it. Welcome to Why Not Play, a series where I talk about why I play and why maybe you should play various decks. This week I'm talking about Monarchs, a true legacy deck, one that's seen meta relevance multiple times over the years and another fan favorite series of monsters. There's really one truly solid reason to play Monarchs and that is because Lithium 2300 will provide you with modern deck lists to net deck for as long as he plays the game. That is only somewhat said jokingly, they're his favorite deck to my knowledge, so he's putting out solid deck builds pretty regularly and you know that they're coming from someone who cares about and is aware of the flaws of their favorite deck. A hilarious tidbit I learned when making this video is that according to Yugipedia, the Monarch monsters are not an archetype, at least not in the technical sense. They're a series of monsters, but the spell and trap cards are an archetype. There is a Monarch archetype that is exclusively spell and trap, and not the monsters. I guess that's because to be an archetype, you have to have a common name and at least one card that lists that name for support. And the monarch monsters, Edia and Erebus, list monarch spell and traps in their effects. And then the monarch spell and trap don't ever list the term monarch. They, they mention what I'm gonna refer to in this video as monarch stats. They need either a monster with 2,800 attack and 1,000 defense, or 2400 attack and a thousand defense, which is useless information, but technical and kind of funny. Do with it what you will. If you disagree with what I just said and feel the need to type out a paragraph explaining why I'm wrong and don't know what I'm talking about, go right ahead. I don't care. And if I see a paragraph, I both will not read it and probably I'm just gonna type out the word cool and then move on with my life. Speaking of moving on, why you should play the deck. Stormforth Erebus. Thanks for watching. Leave a comment. <laughs> okay, yeah, 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 no, actually. Monarch is one of the very few decks in the game that uses tribute summoning, the act of not special summoning your big beat sticks. This can be tough as a tribute summon counts as your normal summon, so you only get the one by conventional means. Because of this, Monarch decks always need means of getting out tribute fodder for free without the use of their normal. And boy, are there plenty of ways to do that. In the past, they would use cards like Treeborn Frog or Destiny Hero Malicious, or just taking the opponent's monsters with cards like Brain Control, Mind Control, or Soul Exchange. In modern builds, it's common to use the Squires, uh, support from the Monarch Structure deck and the newest ways of support, monsters that will give an additional normal summon or cheat out a free monster to summon and sack off. Or there's just the iconic Stormforth, a quick play spell that allows you to tribute your opponent's monsters for your summons. There are two types of Monarchs to consider when building your deck. There's all in all, six original Monarchs and six upgraded forms, and then two of the new Big Daddy boss monsters, I'm just gonna call it. For the originals, there's the level sixes with 2400 attack and 1000 defense, with a variety of solid effects, and their Mega Monarch counterparts, level eight monsters with 2800 attack and 1000 defense, and callback similar solid effects with bonuses if you tributed a monster with the same attribute to summon them. To help make the big Mega Monarchs easier to summon, they all have an effect that they can be tributed with one Tribute Summon by tributing a monster that was itself Tribute Summoned. Of the original six Monarchs, we've got one for each attribute, and five of them are solid. Grand Marg is not solid, despite being the rock. It destroys one set card, whether it's a monster or a spell and trap, but it's underwhelming. Mega Grand Marg can instead pop two set cards, and if it was tribute summoned using an earth monster, we'll draw a card. Zaborg destroys one monster on the field and Mega Zaborg does the same thing. But if Mega Zaborg destroys a light monster, both players send monsters from the extra deck to the grave equal to the destroyed monster's level or rank. And if you tributed a light monster to first tribute summon it, you will choose what the opponent sends from their extra deck. This one is degenerate and not often played in the most fun of decks. Little Thestalos will discard one random card from the opponent's hand, and Mega Thestalos looks at the opponent's hand then chooses what it discards, as well as burning for a thousand damage if summoned using a fire type. 
Both Thestaluses will burn if they discard a monster. Little Thestalos burns for 100 times the discarded monster's level. Big will just burn for 200 times the discarded monster's level. Little Mobius destroys two spell or trap and Mega Mobius pops three. And if Tribute Summoned using a water, we'll make it so the opponent cannot chain the spell and trap cards that it targeted for its effect. Ryza is definitely one of the stronger targeting one card on the field and putting it on its owner's deck, with Mega Ryza targeting one card on the field and one in either player's graveyard to stack them on top of the deck. And if summoned by tributing a wind monster, we'll return a second card on the field to the hand as well as the two that went to the deck. Busted, especially for flu wanderees. Caius will banish one card on the field and burn a thousand if it banishes a dark monster, and Mega Caius banishes a card and burns for a thousand no matter what. Fuck you, piece of shit. Mega Caius banishes any card and burns for a thousand no matter what. Then if it's a dark monster that was banished, all other copies of that monster in the player's hand, main deck, extra deck, and graveyard are banished. And if Tribute Summoned using a dark monster, it will just target two cards to banish instead. All solid, both in terms of effects and in terms of artwork, which is always a benefit when playing a deck. In terms of modern builds of the deck, you'll probably play maybe one of the Mega Monarchs listed of your choice. Of the 12 monsters, one of them to your preference will be playable. Because the good ones are Erebus and Aether. Both will send two Monarch Spell and Trap from the hand or deck to the graveyard to activate their effects. Erebus can shuffle one card from the opponent's hand, field, or graveyard when summoned, and Aether can summon one monster with Monarch stats from the deck, then return it to the hand during the end phase. Erebus has an additional effect in the grave to discard one Monarch Spell or Trap to add any monster with Monarch stats from your grave to your hand, and Aether can banish a Monarch Spell or Trap from the grave to immediately tribute summon itself, and that's as a quick effect. In 2016, these two helped catapult Monarch into meta status, being the strongest and most annoying Monarch build to date and able to turn one disrupt with Erebus ripping apart their hand or break boards on turn two with Aether and Erebus. Other monsters worth mentioning for the deck include Majesty's Fiend and Vanity's Fiend, two monsters with Monarch stats that block either monster effects entirely or special summoning entirely, which is just great for being an annoying player. And there's also Kuraz, the Light Monarch, who can pop two cards on the field and then the owner of the destroyed cards will draw for each one destroyed. This can be used to clear your opponent's board to make for an OTK or to draw more cards from your deck by popping your own monsters or spell and traps. And the Monarch have plenty of spell and traps to abuse. Most infamously is Stormforth which allows you to tribute the opponent's monsters as mentioned earlier at the cost of not being able to summon from the extra deck during the turn you use it. And since it's a quick play, it pairs beautifully with Aether to tribute a monster on the opponent's turn. There's also Pantheism, which is a Monarch Spell and Trap trade-in that once per turn can banish itself from the grave to reveal three Monarch Spell and Traps and the opponent will choose one of them to add to your hand. The draw effect is not once per turn, so opening multiple is never a problem, and not only can you reveal three of the same card off of the effects to search, but you can also reveal the other two copies of Pantheism in your deck if you want more drawing. They also have March of the Monarchs, a continuous spell that prevents tribute summoned monsters from being targeted or destroyed. Return of the Monarchs will once per turn add a monster with Monarch stats when you tribute summon. Both of these will lock you out of the extra deck, which is relevant in some builds, I suppose. Escalation of the Monarchs will let you tribute summon during the opponent's turn on top of Aethers, and Frost Blast is a searchable card that can destroy up to two set cards in one turn by itself, provided you have, you know, one other Monarch Spell and Trap in the grave, but that's not hard to do. Monarchs Erupt is Cancer Skill Drain that I hate with a passion because of True Draco, but it is a Monarch card and therefore searchable in this deck. If you do plan on using it, you will be needing to play an extra deck free version because you can't have an extra deck to use it, and if at any point your Tribute Summon monster goes, it will go at the end of the field as well. But it is a phenomenal skill drain, so... Gotta mention it. The Prime Monarch is one of the best traps in the deck, being able to recycle Monarch spell and traps from the graveyard and then draw a card. Or if it's in the graveyard, can summon itself by banishing another Monarch spell and trap to use as tribute fodder. And then finally, there's Tenacity, which can reveal one monster with Monarch stats to gab any Monarch spell or trap. And pairs perfectly with Pantheism because if you can't search out the other two copies of Pantheism. The third one can be Tenacity, so you're guaranteed getting the exact card you want. The last spell I'm going to mention 
though the one with true importance is Domain of the True Monarchs, a key piece for the modern monarch strategy and the entire strategy of certain builds. Once per turn, you can reduce one monster in your hand's level with 2800 attack and 1000 defense by two, making all of your Megas or Aether and Erebus one tribute summons, regardless of what you're tributing, and it gives an attacking boost of 800 to any attacking tribute summon monster. Neat. Oh, and I, I guess I could mention the fact that uh, if you don't have an extra deck and you have a face-up tribute summon monster and the opponent doesn't, you kind of sort of scythe lock your opponent for the entire game. And until they get rid of domain, they can't use the extra deck, which heavily cripples multiple decks, especially when coupled with like a vanities fiend on field preventing any special summoning because most decks don't play spell and trap removal outside of like nightmare phoenix which is locked into the extra deck so if you want to be that guy it's kind of an okay strategy it's degenerate as shit it's the best way to play the deck currently at least at the making of this video before any hypothetical future support but you will not be popular at locals if it's what you're playing all of it makes for a pretty compelling reason to pick up the deck. Even more so when you realize that 90% of these all came in a structure deck. So if you can get yourself three copies of it, you essentially have the full deck. And that was a big reason the deck became so relevant in the 2016 meta. It was one of the cheapest competitive decks in this game's history. And that holds true to this day. The deck core is cheap. And the slower, more controlling play style can be a bit of a breath of fresh air compared to the modern combo style that you're maybe used to. And I even mentioned things like Eddie's Synergy with a banished copy of Pantheism, the cheeky chaining of an engrave prime monarch effect, to the activation of an on-field Prime Monarchs effect to shuffle one card and still draw and then get the free card on board. There's a lot of little synergies that can be really fun to play out over the course of your turns, even if you're most likely ending on the least fun board in the game. It's a deck that's essentially being perfected at this point. It does have Lithium working on it after all. Redonkulous. The modern domain lock version is simple and effective in a local setting, but I also want to mention older versions of the deck. As formats come and go, some just suck. Shoutouts to the Adventure Engine. I I hate you so much. I don't I don't want to pay $400 for for the for the for the meta right now. There are some cool things, you know, based or the pile or whatever you call the 60 card variants are pretty neat, but overall I'm just not a big fan of this format. Different people like different formats. As they come and go, you'll probably find that you like some and dislike some others. And that's fair. Yu-Gi-Oh! is a game with a long and a rich history of different varying skill level formats. And if you pick yourself up a Monarch Core, you'll be able to play throughout most formats. This deck's legacy is one of the longest in the game. It's been viable across multiple metas. And if you've got a friend group, regardless online only or in paper, I really recommend trying out some older formats. You can find builds for deck lists for Monarchs going all the way back to 2006. Extra Deck Monarchs was one of the best decks in 2016 and it uses the new support and it's fantastic and fun and a bit more thought provoking than the Domain Lock. I really recommend trying it out. You gotta know to balance when you storm forth the opponent's cards on your turn because if you do that, you're locked out of your Extra Deck and it's called Extra Deck Monarchs. There's a lot of good plays you can make in the Extra Deck. Or things like Perfect Circle Monarch, which has one of my favorite names ever, or Soul Control by activating Soul Exchange and tributing for Thestalos, getting rid of the opponent's monster on field and a card in their hand to kind of control the game. There's a lot of variety to these cards. They've got strong effects and they've got a history of being decent. So by all means, if you pick yourself up a core, you'll find you can play this deck across countless formats, and even though you're playing the same cards, you can still keep the game fresh. It's a blast. The slower, one summon per turn type of playstyle that Monarch decks often have can be really addicting. Which Monarchs to play, how many of them to play, which ones to summon when you open multiple, all these different sorts of things can make for an interesting and overall slower but more forward thinking gameplay compared to modern's prevent turn two from happening style of gameplay. There's also the fact that in Master Duel it's confirmed that they apparently just roam around and destroy things and ending lives. Which means if you're a lore fan, uh, the monarchs are just assholes through and through. Which is very fitting for a deck that would play something like the Domain Lock. That being said, it ain't all sunshine and rainbows. Regardless if you're playing 2006 Monarchs or 2030 Monarchs, whenever you're looking at this, 
This deck has one very real and prominent problem, bricking. This deck is the king of bricks, as you're essentially running two engines, no matter what variant of the deck you're building. You're running Tribute Monsters and Tribute Fodder. And if you open too much of one and not the other, you're done. Too many Monarchs makes for an unplayable hand where no summons are possible, and no Monarchs means that any play you can make isn't going anywhere because all your deck's plays are just meant to facilitate Monarchs. And there's nothing you can do about that. It's just the nature of the deck. Also, because you're playing with a one power summon per turn type of deck, your plays are more often than not predictable at best and preventable at worst. Still, they're an iconic series and they offer a unique play style, one that can be played across countless formats and compete with just as many decks. And there's one undeniable reason to play Monarchs. To quote the man himself, playing Monarchs just means that you are purely based. You're goddamn right, Libya. Thanks for watching. Leave a like and a comment if you enjoyed. Don't forget to praise our Lord and Savior, Ryza. And as always, subscribe to YDO Strats so you too can become a true duelist. Oh.